Welcome to the Royals Rundown Podcast, everyone. The premier Kansas City Royals podcast presented by Royals Review. I am Jake Milham, joined by Jeremy Greco, as always. Jeremy, how are we doing this Sunday evening? Mm, uh, we're, I'm, I'm the co-host of the premier Royals Ooh. podcast, uh, <laughs> so uh, how, how could I be anything less than amazing? I, you know what? That is an excellent point. And you are, like you said, you are the walking thesaurus. So I'm sure that wow. we will have some more snappy words to uh, <laughs> to plug in instead of premiere if need be. All right, listen, we have a whole bunch of transactions to talk about and the and how the off season is going to continue to go for the Kansas City Royals. But a few few housekeeping things first. If you want to keep updated on all things Kansas City Royals, you got to go visit RoyalsReview.com. You got news, analysis, and predictions over there, and you can find them on X and on Facebook at Royals Review. Plus, you can support the podcast further by following us on X and TikTok at Royal Rundown Pod. That is R O Y A L R U N D O W N P O D. It feels like it's been forever since I've spelled that out, Jeremy, and wow, that is an absolute mouthful. It's a lot of letters. <laughs> it is. It is a lot of letters. Uh, maybe and that, maybe that a lot Elon of Elon Musk was just like, hey, uh, Twitter's too many letters. Now it's X. <laughs> one one letter. I mean that's a that's a pretty good R. I mean he paid how many billions of dollars for one letter? I guess that's a it's pretty uh, good ROI. If, if you a, ask a lot me. of billions, I guess. I I would almost consider it like even more than the purchase price since the value has tanked since yes. he bought it. <laughs> so so uh, it's not worth what he paid for it anymore either. I'm just saying. Exactly, exactly. And hey, just just another housekeeping thing. I am finally back at home. I am back here in Virginia, so if you hear random dog noises in the background, that is why. I currently have a black Labrador trying to munch on my thumb to get my attention. Um, so that is that is going well. I am losing, unfortunately. So I'll be a nine-fingered co-host here in a little while, I think. Uh, well, you we'll don't see need, how it goes. You don't need fingers to podcast. No, no, not, not really. I just need, like, like... One finger for clicking, and then another, and then another finger for our haters, right? <laughs> oh, so rude! It was so bad. Well, hey, uh, some more some more stuff because I am loving the amount of folks that we are getting listening to us on Spotify, and that is the best thing for engaging with us because you can respond to our polls and questions and answers over there on every single episode. If you respond to the Q and A. We will read your response on air in the following episode. Now, I did I did get a little behind in our last episode. I do apologize. So we're gonna we're gonna get back on track and doing this every single episode. So on our last episode, we asked, "What are you all hoping for this winter? Could be Royals related or not." And everyone just went with Royals related. Jeremy, it was uh, it was pretty straightforward. Turnover. The team loses 106 games. It is time to blow up the team. Luke 57 said, I'm hoping the Royals make some signings and actually try to do something, but really hope to see multiple playoff games across the parking lot. I cannot agree with you more there, Luke. We are, it feels weird not having Chiefs football on a Sunday. We got to wait till Monday night, unfortunately. So screw my sleep schedule. And then Frank DiGiovanni, I, I do apologize if I mispronounce that, Giovanni. said signing, say that again, Jeremy. I would pronounce that D Giovanni. Thank you very much. I I kind of um what's the word slurred the the beginning of that together so I apologize. He said signing a couple of well-priced arms and at least one more bat for this lineup and then go to Bobby with a very good offer. They are well aware of the investment in the product that funds the project. Um while the project could be several different things there, Frank. It's uh, I can't disagree with you on your points made. Thinking, so, I'm thinking it's the real estate project. Yeah, probably so. Probably so. Which I will, I will say we we have spent a lot of time talking about the stadium stuff on on past episodes. I understand that there is some speculation about a third site for the new Royal Stadium. I I am going to touch that with the with a thousand foot pole. Just gonna I just gonna keep it moving. I just want to say one real quick thing about that. 
And that thing okay. is that the fact that they're looking at a third site tells me that they're not leaving Kansas City. If they can't get the deal they want in East Village, they're still looking in the general vicinity. Uh, Ooh, so that's a, that's a really good point. So don't if you're stressing about oh they're going to go to Nashville. Don't I, I've said this before, but this is just more evidence that like no they're really focused in on somewhere in this area. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Jeremy. I didn't even think about that. All right, but we have plenty to talk about this episode because there were a couple of really big 40-man roster deadlines this past week, and the Royals were very active. It is It was something that I was very happy to see. They were acquiring players. They were moving on from players. It was, uh, Jeremy, before we go into each individual move, how were you feeling about the activity level of the Royals this uh, this past week? So when they did... Uh, the promotion day, um, and we our podcast unfortunately had technical difficulties, so we both uploaded TikToks with our own re- individual reactions. Um, I was not super happy. I felt like there was no sense of urgency reflected in those moves. Um, they did what they had to and absolutely no more. Uh, but as the week has gone on, they've made a few more transactions. So I think things are looking a little bit better, but obviously this is... This has got to be just the very bare beginning of what is to come for this team. Yeah, and I will. I, I do want to. I do want to point out. So one one of the listeners. I want to oh, shoot. I don't want to say the wrong person. So Rupert did talk about in the Q and A that he wanted to see big roster turnover, and I can't. I can't disagree with that because. You don't you don't want all the players back from a 106 loss team unless there were crazy injuries or you're definitely going to see progress. The Royals were more active in the past week than the average Bear, if if that makes sense. There were there were some teams who like non didn't non tender a single player. There were some teams who non tendered like seven or eight, which is kind of what I wanted to see from the Royals. They had that much weight that they could shed. Yeah, uh, I, but unfortunately they didn't. I just uh, when I think about being aggressive, um, the obvious mm-hmm. target for me right now because they're the ones that were most related to the Royals. Kind of was Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah, they didn't necessarily DFA a lot of guys, but they traded a lot of guys mm-hmm. that they weren't otherwise going to keep. And that's a team that had the best record in the NL last year, and a team that has World Series aspirations. And they were like, "No, listen, we're going to be aggressive." In, yeah. in making sure that we continue to win, whereas the Royals are like, no, f- our guys are fine. It's fine. No no need to, to rush. Uh, but anyway, go on. No, and it's I, I think we're going to be talking about some of the, you know, how does this all play into free agency? How should fans expect this to move forward? We're going to talk about that later on in the episode, but let's go ahead and run through some of the major transactions from this past week. So the first trade that the Royals made was acquiring reliever Nick Anderson from the Braves for cash considerations. I was I was very happy to to see this move. I I know Anderson was not great in 2023. I mean, he was he appeared in 35 games, uh 3.06 ERA and 36 strikeouts in like 35 innings. It's it's pretty good numbers. Just his availability and the injury concerns are are still definitely there. Um, MLB trade rumors projects he will make about 1.6 million dollars through the arbitrage. So this is this is the Royals giving up an unknown amount of money for a proven reliever who has done it for multiple seasons. And has done it for a contending team. I think that this was a pretty savvy trade, and one that will help the 2024 bullpen. Do you agree, Jeremy? Absolutely. Um, even because uh, he's been good when he's pitched. The problem, as you said, is that he's been injured quite frequently. Um, and the Royals, they need depth. They need guys who are out there pitching. Um, so, well, uh, let me rephrase. They need many guys to pitch. Yeah. Um, because. All all pitchers get hurt. All players get hurt, except for you know the rare. There's rare exceptions to the rule, but you get it. Um, yeah. So even a guy who's not available all the time, you just you need a lot of guys. And part of the Royals' bullpen problems last year was that they didn't have a lot of guys. Even if we think McMillan is going to be good, MacArthur is going to be good. Um, you know, 
McMillan was hurt, missed the last chunk of the season. Um, Mm -hmm. So you just got to, you got to have a bunch of guys. You got to have a lot of depth. This is one of my complaints about people who point to the 2014 and 2015 Royals is those teams were incredibly healthy. There were just hardly any injuries to speak of, and you just can't count on that happening. Um, If they had lost, say, Lorenzo Cain in 2015 for an extended period of time, they would have had Gerard Dyson, but I don't, I don't, you know, and, and to be fair, that was the best team in the American league that year. Okay. But what if they lose Lorenzo Cain in 2014? Mm, Does does that team make the postseason? I don't think so. Um, So, you know, you just, you got to have a lot of depth is one of the things you got to have in addition to having some high talent guys Uh, and, and adding Nick Anderson adds that depth. Yes, it it does. Yeah, I would if if we had to grade this, I'd give this like a like an A minus trade. I, I it's cash, it's cash for yeah. a guy, and it, for who's you're gonna pay one million, and you only have to have him for a year. So if he sucks, you dump him. That is that's an easy A plus for me. Hey, I I like it, I like it, and and like you said, Anderson is a is a key guy that the Royals could easily move on from if he's underperforming or they could definitely move if he is overperforming and just the team is not doing anything by next trade deadline. So that was uh, that was kind of the primer for, for the rest of the, of the week's moves. The Royals and Braves had another trade in the works, and Jeremy, I want, after I talk about it, I want to get your thoughts first on it. So the Royals traded Jackson Kowar to Atlanta for Kyle Wright. Um, Kowar, a former first-round pick by the Royals, former top pitching prospect in the farm system by the Royals, just could not uh, get it done in any of his MLB appearances, and the Royals moved on in favor for starter Kyle Wright. What were you thinking about this move, Jeremy? So from Atlanta's perspective, I think it's pretty obvious that they said, we want whatever Jackson Kowar is going to give us in – this year, because Kyle Wright's not pitching in 2024, um, Kowar's probably a reliever even for Atlanta. But, you know, maybe they think they can fix him so far as to make him a starter. Um, and and from the Royals' perspective, what this tells me is we're not hanging on to our guys just because they're our guys. We're not just going to be, uh, oh, we're embarrassed because a guy that we gave up on has succeeded elsewhere. Um, Jackson, if Jackson Kowar still has a ton of talent, um, and it's, it was really time for the Royals to move on from him though, because it just wasn't working in Kansas city. So, uh, the willingness to move on there and to get somebody like a Kyle Wright, who, by the way, led the national league with 21 wins, had a terrific ERA, got Cy Young votes in 2022, um, for 2025 is, is, and and 2026, you got two seasons of him basically healthy, um, and and again, no guaranteed money there. So if he's just not coming back from the injury, all right, well, time to let him go. Uh, and we gave up Jackson Kowar, who wasn't adding anything anyway. This is another move that is, uh, it it tells me that the Royals are, are being a little bit more transactional, which is what we've asked for. And it's a move that I think is really smart as far as like, they're not going to tie themselves down to anything monetarily, but there's a lot of upside that could possibly be had there. Yeah, I I fully agree with that, Jeremy. And I think that's the, this is very much a long-term Move. This is not something to address the shortfalls on the 2024 roster, and this is this is where I do want to get on to some Royals fans on social media because this is I think that we are very much underestimating how possibly impactful this move can be. Okay, Kyle Wright was and he he was the best starter on a con- World Series contending team. And the Royals just got him for a negative war player in two seasons in a row. I'm sorry, that is a that is a great, great trade for the Royals. And I get it, you're not going to see him in 2024. That's all right. Okay, right. Haha, uh-huh. see what I did there? He <laughs> is, he's 26 years old. Right's 26 years old. You're going to get the best years of his career. And he's just now entering arbitration. Okay, he is... He is going to have two more years of team control following the 2024 season. 
if we we all wanted this team to start looking to okay, we want to see some leaps and bounds from 2023. We wanted to see those in 2025 and 2026. That's the that was the realistic time timeline and Kyle Wright plays into that plan. So I absolutely loved this move. And Jeremy, something that I did want to point out is both Anderson and Wright are guys who very much lean on their curveball. And I want I wanted to point out because James MacArthur was is another pitcher who the Royals traded for last season who relies heavily on the curveball. So we've we have been looking for, okay, what does this new pitching staff want? What does this new pitching development pipeline want? in their in their players and i think maybe a reliance upon off speed stuff could be uh could be something to look at am i am i crazy here no um i think especially when you look at a macarthur you see a guy that the royals said listen we see we see what he's done we see who he is we think we know how to get him to where he needs to be and and they had success for a month uh will that success be uh, extended well we'll find out in 2024 but, uh, you know, it's at least a really good start. And so I, we really, I, mean, I think we saw this with Cole Reagans too, where the, the, the team really does seem to have an idea of these are the kinds of pitchers that we can work with and help improve. Um, and they're going out and getting them. So that, that's a really excellent point. Um, and and while well, you were talking about the fact that he wasn't going to pitch next year and people were upset, I actually think that that's really important for what the Royals are doing. Also, I didn't quite think of this when I was – mentioning this before, but it tells us that the Royals aren't going to chase every single win at the expense of the team in the long term. Um, that was something Dayton Moore loved to do was every single win matters. I can't get rid of Jackson Kowar for a pitcher who's not even going to pitch next year because Jackson Kowar might help us win a game next year would be kind of Dayton Moore's approach. Uh, yeah. So having having a GM who's like, listen, no, the team is still not going to be good next year. So I've got to do something that can help the team improve. You know, if I can help the team improve in 2024, great. But if I'm not going to hurt the team in 2024 much, but I can improve it drastically in 2025 and 2026, I'm going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that's a really important thing to highlight as well, that we, we as Royals fans, with the way that MLB is set up, we're going to have to kind of accept that the team isn't going to be good and that the GM uh, sacrificing a win in 2024 when it doesn't matter to gain multiple wins in 2025, 2026 when it might matter. Yes, yes, it is. So definitely we won't see the return on investment in 2024, but we do have that to look forward to in 2025. So definitely looking forward to that. Um, rounding out the moves that the Royals made last week. So they non-tendered Austin Cox, Josh Stalmont, Logan Porter, and Diego Hernandez. They did not offer them contracts, making them free agents. Um, that was, these weren't surprising moves, unfortunately. I do want to say the the Diego Hernandez one was a little bit, um, he's he's a top 15 prospect in the pipeline, but he missed a ton of time this year with a with a shoulder he injury. Healthy. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't lights out like like he was. He definitely took a big hit in his trajectory in 2023, so I imagine that he'll that he'll return to the to the system and I, try I to mean, reclaim what he had. The Royals have already signed all four of those guys to minor league deals. They're so all... I do I, I I do want to correct you there because they have not yeah. re-signed um Stalmont. Have they not? I read that they have. No. Maybe, maybe that was misreported. Um, the last, please go, please go ahead and, and, and look it up while I'm while I'm talking about this. But the last report that that I'm seeing is that the Royals re-signed Porter, Hernandez, and Cox to minor league deals, as well as adding Luis Sessa on a oh, minor league okay. deal. Maybe um, I just saw the four lines and, no. and assumed. But uh, you're right. I do not see Josh Stamont here now. And we will. I'm I'm curious to see how that shakes out. I don't know if he feels like he will have a better chance with another organization. He, but he might. Um, 
Sessa is a is a guy that I'm not going to put a whole lot of major league expectations on. Um, he's he's been in the league for a while, eight years in the big leagues between the Yankees and the Reds. Um, more of a a middling performer. This year with Cincinnati, he didn't do a whole lot of anything good. A 9 ERA, 11 strikeouts to 12 walks in 26 innings. So he's he's a guy that the Royals might look to call up from AAA later on this season, but I'm not I'm not putting a whole lot of expectations on him. Are you, Jeremy? He's a, he's a Brooks Krisky. He's a yeah. Uh, you know, one of those guys that they they signed a bunch of veterans Every year, every team does this, signs a bunch of veterans to minor league deals uh, for that depth. And they're like, well, maybe he'll he'll get something back and we'll have, you know, at least we'll have a proven veteran if somebody gets hurt, when somebody gets hurt. <laughs> um, let's see some more moves that the Royals made. They agreed to a contract with Josh Taylor, avoiding mm-hmm. arbitration with him. Yeah, it was, uh, I had... I was looking forward to to your reaction on on this one, Jeremy. Long long story short, the lefty avoided arbitration. Price saved the Royals a little bit of money, agreeing to a contract below his arbitration projection at one point one million dollars. Um, but I mean, Josh Taylor really didn't do a whole lot for the for the Royals in twenty twenty three. So I am I'm just kind of like this is this is a jag move. It's just a guy. Yeah. It. Reminds me a lot of when they agreed to terms with Ryan O'Hearn last year, mm. um, which everyone was like, why would you do that? And and then they ended up cutting him later yeah. in the season. And it's like, well, you know, we just thought maybe, but then we ended up filling that spot. So that tells me that actually does tell me something about perhaps the direction of these Royals, because one of the things that the Ryan O'Hearn move probably should have signaled to us last off season is that the Royals weren't looking to be particularly active in free agency. They didn't necessarily anticipate... If if they're looking to be very active in free agency, then somebody like that is a guy that you go, okay, well, we're going to have to cut him to make room for the other guys that we're going to bring in. So Mm -hmm. uh, we're just not going to tender him an offer. And, And when you tender a guy like Josh Taylor, you're like, well... We might not find anybody we like better than Josh Taylor, so we might as well make sure he's still here. Right, and that's, I mean, I I don't like that that move and that reasoning is is true, but it, it is. And like you said, sometimes you just need depth. At at the end of the day, Taylor's a guy who has MLB experience at least. You you he's, know what he brings. He's also barely pitched for the last two years. Yeah. Yeah, that's a uh, that's another concern, and I, you know, I bet you if he's just not recovering very well, that he is either just released later on down the road, or he's stashed on the sixty day IL to start the yeah. season, something along those lines. I I would not be surprised. I let me the I would put it as likely that he does not open the year with the Royals. That he maybe does. He's not even on the team in spring training, but. So what concerns me isn't that he's still on the roster. What concerns me is, is like I said, the bit about where, well, if you're even bothering to tender him, that's because you don't think you need that roster spot, which yeah. tells me you're not you're not going to be necessarily very aggressive. Yeah, that's a uh, sad but true. Hey, so and speaking of Royals, eBay, go ahead. If the Royals finish their evaluation season and say, man, we really need to improve, but then – don't improve why did we bother evaluating yeah and i'm i'm hopeful that them moving on from jackson coar was a part of that evaluation i'm hopeful yeah, of that two things the two th- moves do seem to be at odds with each other in terms they, of they like, do. What, what is this team doing yes they they definitely do um to wrap up the moves the royals tendered contracts to more arbitration eligible players including righties Brady Singer, Carlos Hernandez, lefty Chris Bubich, woohoo, Woo. and outfielder Edward Olivares. Um, now that does not mean that they agreed to terms on a contract. Tendering contracts is just the first step in the arbitration process. They still have a little more than like they have like a month and a half. They have until mid-January to negotiate what their 2024 salary is going to be. 
or we could just have another messy Brady Singer situation like we did this this past year. Yeah. It's uh it, it can be a little interesting. We'll we'll see how that ends up. I am I will say I don't think I'm very surprised that they extended or sorry, excuse me, that they tendered contracts for those four players. Um I I guess I am a little surprised or I am hopeful that they at least tried to trade Edward Olivares, especially after adding Tyler Gentry to the 40 man roster. Tendering um, Edward Olivares gives you an opportunity to trade him instead of just right. letting him go for nothing. Oh, you you know what? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Jeremy. That's I, I was getting that mixed up in my head. Yeah. Um so ho- hopefully we hear some we hear some movement, some news on those negotiations, but are are you mad about this at all, Jeremy? No. Uh Edward Olivares is like again, if you were planning to be really super duper aggressive, like more aggressive than cutting Josh Taylor, you would you would non tender him and then, you know, find your way. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, but it's not a mistake to tender him because he does seem to have some value with his bat um, and look for a team that's like, man, we would like a designated hitter who we know isn't, you know, he's got a little juice, maybe not a mm-hmm. lot of juice, but we don't have to pay him much. Um, yeah. and, or somebody who thinks they can, they can unlock more juice in Edward Olivares. Maybe um, it's a deal that I, I offering him arbitration isn't a mistake. Uh, in the same way that offering arbitration to Josh Taylor seems to have been. <laughs> yeah. And I will, you know, I was looking through some MLB.com articles this weekend and Mark Feinsand put out one about like the top, the top free agents at, at each position and stuff like that. And he listed Jorge Soler as the top left field option. And, and I get field. that. Yeah, I know. Right. It's listen, if there are that many uninspiring options for power bats who can at least play, I'm not saying that they can succeed, but at least play in the outfield, then I'm sure that there is a trade market for Edward Olivares. So I think I think being super aggressive would be moving on from him. But like you, I'm not I'm not mad. I'm not over the moon about it. I'm not mad either. So now with all that being said, that was that was a flurry of roster moves in in one week. That was yep. a lot. I want to make it clear that we're not going to see that many moves in one period again for quite some time. There were a few a few roster deadlines this past week. You also had the owners meetings which might have, you know, moved some things along, but the next real like thing that we're looking forward to is December 3rd through the 6th, the winter meetings in Nashville, which should be very interesting. Um, the draft lottery is going to be held during that time. The rule five draft is going to be held during that time. So it'll, it'll be very interesting to see what and comes they, out of those meetings. They did at least clear space so that they could get a rule five guy or two. Yes, that, that they did. And we'll, so, we'll see if they have Go ahead. Again, not as lacking aggression as last year, not as passive as last year. Yes, there there are signs at least that this front office is being a little bit more forward leaning. Are they being as aggressive as we want them to? No. Are they probably being realistically aggressive though, Jeremy? I think they are. I guess. <laughs> I I believe in unrealistic aggression. Let's go get Shohei. Let's go get uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone. We, we want Verlander. I don't know. <laughs> well, hey, speaking of MLB free agency, I do want to point out that one of the big dominoes fell today in Aaron Nola reportedly oh, yeah? agreeing to a seven-year, $172 million deal going back to the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, I, I do feel bad for Bob Nightingale who gets a bad, bad rep, rightfully so amongst baseball fans. He had the news first, but really no one believed it until, um, some other reporters came in behind him and confirmed it. That is a, that's a big domino to fall in the, in the starting pitching market for this free agency and kind of sets a decent expectation for, okay, how aggressive our team's going to be. 
what's the what's the going rate for a very very good starting pitcher and you know what that is that's a lot of money <laughs> that is a yeah, lot I did the math. of money it was like 24 million dollars a year um, yeah that's that's how it comes out to so he he's he's not Verlander, not Scherzer, which we knew that I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's probably more than the Royals are thinking about paying any starting pitchers. So anybody you look at and you're like, ah, he comps pretty well to Aaron Nola, probably scratch him off your list. Unfortunately, yeah, un- unfortunately. So I am hoping that that is that that is not the case. Um, but we shall see. Sorry, Jeremy, you were you were breaking up there a little bit on my end. But hey, yeah. let's go ahead and we'll we'll keep it moving here. So all that put together, the we'll we'll probably see some odds and ends moves here and there. But for the time being, Jeremy, you had a really good piece come out on Saturday titled Championships Cannot Be Acquired Through Free Agency Alone. And I will say I was learning a little bit more about this, at least in the NFL realm. And I want to say that many of the points you made reflect that. And yeah. I want to I want you to kind of just give a little synopsis of your piece. And then I wanted to talk about it with you. How's that sound? Sounds good. So basically, um, I like how you call this really good. And I'm looking at it going, man, I... I uh I lost my sense of direction somewhere in there. Um I had just a couple I had a few different directions I was thinking about going with it and I think I tried to go in too many of them at once and it didn't quite work the way I wanted to. <laughs> um the basic idea I started with was that the Royals under Dayton Moore tried to reach the playoffs without ever using free agency and that really didn't work. Um even in 2015 when they were the best team they did use free agency Edens Volquez uh, Kendris Morales, among others. Um, and then the Mets tried to use free agency solely kind of to to reach the playoffs uh, this year. Um, and even they didn't necessarily sign a lot of free agents, but they did retain a couple of guys in Brandon Nimmo and Edwin Diaz who had reached free agency, but were Mets prior to that, but gave them, they handed out a lot of money this past off season. Actually this past off season was the most, uh, free agent spending ever in Major League history. Um, so that was interesting, but the Mets were a big part of that. And then they ended up, you know, playing under 500 for the year. And and so I kind of was like, well, why did the Mets fail when everyone saw them spending all this money and saw all these great free agents? And they already had guys like uh, Francisco Lindor and, and, and uh, Murphy, I think. Not Daniel Murphy, um, Jeff Jeff McNeil, I don't know. They had a decent second baseman. Pete Alonso at first. So they had a bunch of guys that could really play. And they added a, some big name free agents yeah. and they just didn't go anywhere. And and I wonder <laughs> yeah. well, what what does this mean? Um and uh and my what I realized, and this is I guess what I kind of started to like lose the focus on my article, was I realized that really the problem with free agency is that by the time players reach free agency, they're usually past their primes. Um, and and it makes it difficult to, to, to win through free agency because you can go get a Justin Verlander, but oops, he's a little bit older now and he's hurt. Or you can go get a Max Scherzer. Oops, he's a little bit older now. He's not as good as he was. But you because there are so few free agents um, and because – the you know the the really talented ones are are so rare you've got to really pay out the nose to bring them in and it just it just doesn't seem to work out so you really i i've advocated in the past that the royals should just really go out there and just spend a lot of free agent money let's let's go buy a championship i think that would be more fun than watching them lose 106 games uh but i realized that you probably can't do that under the current system and a lot of people took away from that that i was saying the royals shouldn't get any free agents and sign any free agents. And that's not what I'm arguing at all. Uh, what I, what I really wanted to point out was just like the free agent system is broken to the point where like you have to develop some internal talent to be good and then fill in the gaps with free agents. And I'm not sure that that's actually good for the sport of baseball. I think if we had, and this is going to sound like very pro player, 
Uh, <laughs> but I think that the rookie deals, the team control should be smaller by a year or two, maybe even. Okay. Um, just because we need, I think it would be better for the sport if there was more free agency. And that sounds like, oh, well, you just want guys to get paid a whole ton of money. But I think if there were more free agents, um, we would see, we would actually see the cost of those free agents go down because mm. now Justin Verlander wouldn't be the only pitcher worth signing on the free agent market last year. There'd be a bunch of guys. Um, and maybe you don't got to overpay for uh, uh, the guy that the Royals got that I don't like, the innings eater. I cannot, I've forgotten his name suddenly. Um, I'm just going to just gonna move on, I guess. Um, did you type it to me? You typed it to me. Cool. Uh, talk for two minutes. I'm talking for two minutes. Cool. Uh, right. So that guy um, that I can't stand, they, they sign him. Maybe if there's more free agents, you can get a guy who's a little bit better for that same amount of money just because there's more people to to sign. And and so really, I, I think what we're kind of talking about is supply and demand here um, because there's a demand for a certain number of players. But if the supply is greater, then you don't have to pay any of them as much. So maybe free agency would work out better for the for the players or excuse me, for the teams uh, mm. than it currently does. And that would be of a, a benefit to everyone. And I, you know, I do wonder, some guys are going to get more money because they're going to reach free agency sooner, but I feel like maybe the superstars would actually get less money, which wouldn't be awful for the sport. I think the more you spread out the money among the players, the better it is for the health of the sport. Like, it's, I don't think it's necessarily ideal that Justin Verlander gets $41 million and then the next tier drops all the way to 27. Um, if they were both making 30, that I think might be better for the sport of baseball. But uh, yeah. obviously I'm not, uh, we're not going to see that anytime soon. <laughs> so we just kind of got to live with the system we've got, I guess, which means that the Royals absolutely are going to have to figure out drafting and developing because they're yeah. just not going to be able to uh to sign all these free agents and the trading is is you know the trading has value but again you have to have something to trade yep that's the and you have to have in a sense expendable talent to be right. able to trade it and still have a competent team so what i my biggest question coming out of this article was your your last header which was so what about the royals like how does how does this system affect the 2023 royals and i think that i think that you you summarized it really well you have to mag quote you have to maximize opportunities for improving your roster in other ways by sending veterans away for young potential and looking for reclamation projects which i think one of the great you know the royals traded for two great examples of that they got nick anderson a proven guy who needed an opportunity to flourish and kyle wright who just needs a year of recovery and you'll you see what you got in him there so it is i'm i'm definitely looking forward to to seeing how aggressive the dollars are spent by the kansas city royals this free agency um but everyone out there, please go check out this article. Jeremy is dogging on himself. It's it still makes a lot of good points, and it comes across clearly for me at least. <laughs> um, you can check out that linked in the episode description below. But Jeremy, great work as always, and I and I love it. I love reading your your weekend columns. But for right now, how about we move on to some Royals review reviews? How's that sound? Sounds like a plan. All righty. Well, hey, so Jeremy, do you? All right. Do you mind starting us off? No, I'll go ahead and start us off. Uh, so I have been <laughs> watching a new anime while I work out. I like to watch anime that I can only get subbed while I work out because that's just how it works best with my neurodivergent brain. Um, and so I picked up Wotakoi Love is Hard for Otaku on Amazon Prime Video. Um, and that is, as you might imagine, kind of a rom-com, kind of slice-of-life, goofy anime about four people 
who are all otaku, which if you're not familiar with the term, it basically is the Japanese term for people who love video games or anime, uh, prepare, especially if they're adults. Um, so these are, these are adults that all work at some kind of boring office job and they all have uh, a love of these things. One of them is loves uh, fanfic, one of them loves cosplay, one of them loves video games, and one of them loves uh, manga, which is basically Japanese comic books. So uh, the it, it's just their their interactions. Um, two two of them, they're two two men and two women, and they're dating each other. The one man is dating one woman, when the other man is dating the other woman, um, and they just kind of it just follows them as they just kind of hang out and live their lives and and do their otaku things, which is kind of fun when you are a nerd yourself and you recognize a lot of those behaviors and traits. Um, so I, it makes me laugh out loud on a regular basis, which is actually pretty hard to do for a TV show, movie, book. I just, I laugh out loud at people constantly, but at media, I just kind of am amused internally and don't laugh out loud. But this one makes me laugh out loud because it's so funny. So, uh, that will be my Royals review, review this week. And just to make sure you all heard the name, it is Wotakoi Love is Hard for Otaku. Alrighty, Jeremy. Thank you very much for the review. I I love hearing about these slice of life, slice of life. Excuse me, animes that that you watch because it's definitely outside of my normal viewing. So I will say that. Um, what I am going to review, I I have quite a few things that I that I want to review um, this week. I will say that, but I am only going to pick one. Um, and it's all thanks to my wife. So she recently went on a trip out to California and she came back with, uh, with a few records for me. And one of the records that she got for me was Tyler Childers Rustin in the rain. And that is a Americana, you know, if you're not into that genre, that's, that's okay. Kind of on the fringes of country, but Tyler Childers is just a great, uh, lyricist and I really enjoy his voice. I'm sorry, honey. What did you, what did you call it? Americana or Southern Craft. Southern Craft. That, that mix between rock and roll and country. Mm -hmm. So I, I very much in, enjoy the music, but uh, she got me the vinyl for it, and it's absolutely beautiful. It is this, I wouldn't expect it. It's not the normal black. It's kind of a opaque green with some, um, with some like yellow marbling in it. Um, I, it's an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous piece of vinyl, and I think it just adds to the character that comes out in his music. Um, so if you just want to stream some music, highly suggest going and checking out Tyler Childers in general, but his new album Rustin in the rain is very, very good. Um, it was up for some, some awards recently with the CMA. So definitely, definitely worth your time. If you ask me, um, Jeremy, before we get on out of here, I do want to double check with you. Where can folks find your work at? Where are you at nowadays? Uh, so I'm pretty much just on Twitter and, <laughs> uh, Royals review, um, pretty much everything else is taking a back burner, at least for the time being. Uh, mm -hmm. if I go back to any of those things, I have a blue sky account. I, I just can't bring myself to use it for the reasons we've discussed before, where yeah. I already have a community built up on Twitter. Um, so, uh, I, I anticipate I'll eventually move there, but I'm dragging my feet as long as possible. Um, but if anything changes about where you can find me, I will definitely, you all will be the first to know. I love it, Jeremy. I love it. Hey, I, either way, you can find our thoughts on anything Royals related on the Royals Rundown podcast accounts on Twitter and on TikTok. Plus, you can find our, our written thoughts most of the time at RoyalsReview.com. Um, for, for me personally, my personal Twitter has kind of taken a, a back burner. Um, I am posting a lot more on threads. I know folks will, will say what they, what they want about it. Um, but there is a very hearty NFL kind of community over there as of right now. Um, so I have been enjoying engaging in that and growing my following there a little bit. So please go check me out over there at Jacob Milham sports. If you would like to, I always follow back. We gotta, gotta grow that community a little bit more. Um, but Hey, the best things that you could follow for anything, Kansas city Royals related Royals review, follow them on X. You can follow them on Facebook or you can just find everything. A one-stop shop at Royals Jeremy, do you have anything else before we get on out of here? Uh, no. 
rude, rude noises, rude comments, nothing. Not today. Wow, wow. You, gotta, you those have got to be safe for special today. occasions, Jacob. Fair, okay, fair enough, fair enough. You, you got me there. Well, hey, we're going to go ahead and get on out of here and enjoy our Sunday evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for supporting us. One last time, go check us out on Spotify and answer our Q&As, and we will respond to them on the next episode. Thank you all for your support, however you show it. And until next time, go Royals!